Welcome to Whistleblower Network News. I am your host, Jane Turner, FBI whistleblower and advocate. It is our honor to share with you these experiences of real life heroes and people of integrity. Hello, this is Jane Turner with Whistleblower of the Week. And I am your podcast host, FBI whistleblower and whistleblower advocate. And today we have on one of the most remarkable people I have ever met in my life, Stephen Cohn from Cohn, Cohn and Calapinto, the world's leading whistleblower law firm. He just finished and published his book, Rules for Whistleblowers incredible book. I recommend that you get it. If you haven't yet, it lays it out A to B to Z, and it will help you get through this incredibly complex world of whistleblowing. And speaking of that, we're going to talk today, Stephen and I, about Trevor Murray. Trevor Murray worked for UBS as a strategist in its commercial mortgage-backed securities business from 2011 to 2012, where he claims that two leaders improperly pressured him to skew his research, violating SEC regulations. He reported this conduct to his supervisor, who declined to take action. He was, of course, terminated soon after. No surprise here, whistleblowers. In 2014, Murray sued UBS, alleging that his former employer terminated him in response to his complaints about fraud on shareholders in violation of the Surbanes-Oxley Act's anti-retaliation provision, 18 U.S.C. Section 1514A. After nine years, not another surprise whistleblowers, nine years, the case made it to the Supreme Court. The broader question at hand decided if under 18 U.S.C. Section 1514A, a whistleblower must prove his employer acted with, quote, retaliatory intent, unquote, as part of his case in chief. The justices ruled that a whistleblower who invokes Section 1514A must prove that his protected activity was a contributing factor in the employer's unfavorable personnel action, but need not prove that his employer acted with, quote, retaliatory intent. Stephen, we are so happy to have you on this morning because as the leading whistleblower attorney in the world, explain this to us because we're not lawyers out here in the audience. And can you give us a, a, a brief overview of the 2002 Surbanes-Oxley Act? Thank you so much, Jane. And it's an honor to be here. Always a pleasure to talk with you. I mean, you are one of my heroes. You're one of the most important oh. whistleblowers. As you know, you helped get the FBI reforms passed. And so your listeners know she's the only person I know who won two whistleblower cases. One in a jury and one with the Justice Department, which is nearly impossible to do. So, but getting onto socks. Yes. I'll just give you a brief background. Yes. 20, 2001, Sharon Watkins blew the whistle on Enron. It was at the time one of the most important corporate whistleblower cases. Well, the big bosses in Enron went to the leading anti-whistleblower law firm in the country, Kirkland and Ellis, very large mm. firm, and said, can we fire her? And they said, sure you can. There are no uh. laws protecting corporate whistleblowers. And this memo came out, and I'll never forget it, because I was in the uh, U.S. Congress at the time, Senate office building, with Chris Kolesnik, the executive director yes. of the Whistleblower Center, and we were there talking about with this Judiciary Committee, nothing else but FBI whistleblowers. And it came up, Sharon's case. And I said to Senator Leahy's chief of staff, I said, hey, these corporate whistleblowers have no rights. And he kind of scratched his head and he said, really? 
Mm -hmm. And like a couple days later, the story came out about Watkins and this Kirkland Ellis memo. We get a call. Let's do a law. So we worked with the Judiciary Committee, Leahy and Grassley, and we drafted the Sarbanes-Oxley whistleblower law that was passed in 2002. It had three major enhancements of, on other whistleblower laws. We can go through them, but the first is what we're talking about here today. It changed the burden of proof. So for those of you suffering retaliation or yes. trying to figure out how to work through these mazes, under traditional employment law, the employee has to prove that the company had retaliatory motive by essentially 51%. You have to prove it. And you have to prove that the, the reason given for your discharge was a pretext. Two big burdens. That's why most whistleblowers lose. Yes. Because the companies have the high powered lawyers, mm -hmm. they control most of the witnesses, and they have access to all the documents. They also can create this pretext uh, if they carefully plan your firing. So, knowing this, we asked Congress to adopt this newly developed burden that came out in federal employee cases called the Contributing Factor Test, a revolutionary and absolutely significant change in the law, changed it in two ways. First, the statute says instead of having to the whistleblower prove retaliatory motive, by a preponderance of the evidence, which is always hard, proving intent, yes. they only have to prove a contributing factor, which means one factor among many. It could literally be 1%. If you just can show evidence of retaliation, not motivating factor, not 51%, some evidence, the burden of proof shifts. And now it's up to the company to prove they fired you legitimately, but not by a preponderance of the evidence, by a much higher burden known as clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing evidence is the type of evidence you need to strip a parent of custody of their children. It's, it's not as high as beyond reasonable doubt, but it's much higher than preponderance, which is like 51%. So what they did was they made it very easy for the employee to, to meet their burden of a contributing factor, and they shifted it to the company under a much higher burden of proof. Now, you can imagine corporate America's response to this. Yes. In the yes. Law. How attack. did Wall Street attack? Yes. Attack. How, how did Wall courts. Street and, and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, commerce respond to this? That's right. Attack. And the judiciary, as many of your listeners know, is, not off, is often not sympathetic to whistleblowers. No. And they refused to apply this standard. They literally looked at it and said, this is way too pro-employee, pro-whistleblower. They went back to the old standard, which was force the whistleblower to prove by 51% preponderance of the evidence, evidence of motive. And, and just to understand that motive is getting into someone's head. It's very hard to prove. In your, like a, most of like your tort cases, slip and fall, you don't have to prove that the person intentionally pushed you down the stairs. You just have to show that they didn't have the proper banister. You don't need intent. But in a whistleblower case, you do. So they just, they just ignored this provision. Year after year. We watched it. It was just dumbfounding. Year after year. Court after court. So eventually... 
the issue landed before the U.S. Supreme Court in Murray v. UBS. Showdown at the Supreme Court corral. Yes. This is a world-shaking case, isn't it? This is making precedent. It's a this big is, deal. So it's making precedent across the whistleblower world because other statutes use the same burden, and they have all suffered the same fate mm. as Sox. As I mentioned, federal employee cases, but also meat safety, auto safety, consumer rights, consumer financial, across the board, there, that, that Congress started using this burden of proof in modern whistleblower laws across the board. So this precedent not only would cover Wall Street and securities types of violations, but would now cover everything from product safety to meat safety to auto safety and across the board, federal employees. So major precedent. And on one side, Mr. Murray, an individual whistleblower, fighting for his life. On the other side, corporate America, led by the Chamber of Commerce, that has one of the most successful records before the Supreme Court in winning. The Supreme Court over the years has become very pro-corporate. And the chamber has one of the best winning records. Showdown. Wow. So give us a, a, a something about the information about Trevor Murray's case. And I'm also very interested in why it took so darn long, which seems to be the problem with whistleblower cases. Well, Trevor's case, I always found it interesting. He accused UBS, one of the largest banks in the world, of fraud. It always made me chuckle because they're a repeat offender. Uh, they, you know, we did the Birkenfeld case. You yes. have 18,000 illegal accounts worth $20 billion. So, you know, UBS doesn't, you know, they have small frauds, large frauds, big frauds, money laundering. I mean, they are dirty. They are located in Switzerland where whistleblower laws do not apply no. in Switzerland. They've criminalized whistleblowing. Yes. yes. So they're used to having free reign. They're, you know, they're just unbelievable. And they use their corporate might to get away literally with murder. But in Switzerland, they use their corporate might to have the Swiss government protect them. So they're used to bullying people and they're used to just firing whistleblowers. So Trevor took this case on. He went to a jury. He won a million dollar verdict. I don't know the exact amount, but it was over a million. He was right. They were wrong. But the judge applied the correct standard of proof. The judge said to the jury, you can rule for Trevor if you find it was a contributing factor. And if you do, it's up to UBS to prove by clear and convincing evidence they were justified in their action. The jury went with Trevor. UBS took it to the appeals court, which of usually course. in 99 of 100 or 999 of 1,000 cases is the end of the line. Yes. The appeals court of the First Circuit, which is dominated by Democratic appointees, said, no, they went for UBS. They backed Wall Street. They reversed his verdict. Why? Why, Stephen? Exactly what most courts have done over the, since Sarbanes-Oxley was passed. These judges just couldn't believe that a whistleblower's burden of proof, ability to win their case, was strengthened. They couldn't change. Trevor took it to the United States Supreme Court, and that's where the showdown occurred. Because it yes. was very simple. The judge applied the correct standard. The chamber wanted an incorrect standard. Trevor blew the whistle on a notorious bank that is engaged in fraud, but also one of the wealthiest financial institutions 
in the world. Showdown. Yes. Yes. Incredible. So, so of course, this started. He worked there from 2011 to 2012. He started this, you know, uh, uh, judicial a fight back in 20, I think it was 14, correct? Or 2013? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so why did when, it take when, so long? Yeah. And why when did, did it, it get so long? to yeah. the Supreme Court yeah. for uh, this 2023. showdown? 2023. Okay. Why did it take so long? That's what whistleblowers so want to know. Two reasons. First, is corporations with unlimited budgets will spend and hire and fight and appeal, drag out. So they have the resources and they don't care what it costs. They will just lay it out. So they have the resources to drag these cases out. But the real problem here, and where whistleblowers and their supporters must rally on, is what I call repeal by delay. The under-resourcing by the United States government of these whistleblower cases. OSHA, Department of Labor, is supposed to investigate these cases and come up with determinations in 90 days. It takes them years if they ever do. Uh, There's rules about expediting the trials, expediting the cases. They're never followed. No. But more important... The United States government doesn't have the resources. For an IRS whistleblower case, it's now the average is 11 years. We're in the process of resolving a False Claims Act case six or seven years old. They don't have the resources. And what's needed is a push from the grassroots to demand. And that's actually, there's a law pending for the IRS that's going to demand they issue the cases faster or they have to pay interest. (laughs) They figure the IRS responds to money. (laughs) But uh, who knows? uh, Right now, they can delay your cases. They don't have to pay any interest. So the smart people said, how do you get IRS to move? Make them pay interest. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. Hi, we'll be right back with more of Whistleblower of the Week after a quick message from one of our whistleblower friends. Don't go anywhere. Hey, this is Austin Handel, also known as Officer Ash on social media and as the Dunwoody Whistleblower and the Vice Chair of the Lamplighter Project. Leading whistleblower attorney Stephen Cohn's latest book, Rules for Whistleblowers, A Handbook for Doing What's Right, is the ultimate guide to blowing the whistle. Rules for Whistleblowers is an easy-to-read, essential tool for anyone curious about whistleblowing. The book lays out 35 rules to help whistleblowers navigate the complex and dangerous world of whistleblowing. Subscribers to the Whistleblower News Network can also receive 35% off a copy of this indispensable resource. Visit whistleblowersblog.org slash rules for whistleblowers to learn more. But so they, so it they got need to the... resources. That's it. Uh, so, so, and I agree with you there, Stephen, totally. So it got to the Supreme Court. It's a shootout at OK Corral, yeah. and the good guys won. Yeah. But yet, I talked to Trevor the other day, just yesterday. He's excited to come on the Whistleblower of the Week. But guess what? It went down to the lower court. What is going on? Most people think the Supreme Court, law of the land. What happened? Sure. So let's first talk about the Supreme Court. So on the one side, you had corporate America, obviously UBS, and various what's known as amicus briefs, which are friend of the court, uh, and the Chamber of Commerce and corporate allies all filed against him. On the other side, you had Trevor and his lawyer, but whistleblower advocacy groups came in 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 his support. National Whistleblower Center filed an yes. amicus, which I helped author. So we came in and we were discussing the history of the law because we were involved in the original passage. Yes. Uh, and then significantly, Senator Charles Grassley, uh, he, he filed a brief before the court. It's very important. He's been a champion for whistleblowers. And we need more. Yes. Again, it's up to the American people to demand that their representatives and their senators start joining 
on these amicus briefs. If they pass a law, it's their obligation to make sure that the courts implement it correctly. But right now, again, whistleblowers are in the corner. Yes. It was argued out. Nine zero unanimous for the whistleblower. Wow. Slammed up. The Supreme Court did what the advocate said. Read the law. Look what we wrote in 2002. We laid it out explicitly. And the fact that the overwhelming majority of courts were refusing to implement it was not of any concern. They agreed and they backed up the whistleblower. Now you ask what happens next. In all Supreme Court cases, almost all, they don't actually issue a judgment for one side or the other. They correct the issue of law, and then they send it back to the lower court for final resolution. Now, in this case, it should go very smooth. Trevor has prevailed in front of a jury. He has a verdict. The court applied the correct standard, which was the only issue on appeal. And therefore, it should go smooth. They now will have to calculate how much attorney's fees he gets, which should be substantial, because again, whistleblowers have a hard time finding lawyers. But in yes. the law, if the whistleblower wins, the UBS has to pay all of those fees at market rates, which can often be larger than the judgment itself. That lawyer can get over a million dollars. Well, we don't know. He'll have to file a petition. Additionally, there'll be interest. So he was entitled to interest on that million dollar judgment, and that will have to be calculated. Finally, there may be injunctive relief to be issued, <laughs> requiring UBS to put up posters in all their workplaces, letters of apology, cleaning up employment records. So injunctive relief is when you order someone to do something. Then you have monetary relief where you just pay the dollar. So I am not sure what issue, what damage issues remained open, but I believe based on that Supreme Court decision and the jury verdict, Trevor will ultimately fully prevail. And this will be a historic victory for every single corporate whistleblower, federal employee, and other sectors of the economy, and these are significant, for example, all whistleblowers who report a product safety issue now covered, all whistleblowers who retaliated for reporting consumer financial fraud, that's banks redlining if you work for a bank, credit cards ripping you off, that is uh, those, those payday loans that rip people off. These are the types of, of financial laws that impact common people, working people, and now the whistleblowers and all of those entities will be fully protected. And as I say, a series of health and safety issues from truck safety, railway safety, food inspection, auto safety. So there's a slew of whistleblower laws. All will benefit for the perseverance sacrifice that Trevor Murray went through and really the courage of his lawyer to stick with him all these years yes to fight the good fight and it's whistleblowers like him that change the entire dynamic yes and thank you Stephen and for uh, uh, Cone Cone Colapinto and the National Whistleblower Center under the executive uh, director uh, of Siri Nelson for giving that friend of the court motion to them because, like you said, you were there at the beginning, so you you know this stuff inside and out. And so, are are those the precedents that this ruling is going to set? Just about for all whistleblowers, the, they're only for the whistleblowers who have in their statute this standard this revised burden of proof that makes it practical 
for whistleblowers to prevail. That that takes into consideration the fact that companies have almost all the documents, control of the witnesses, and the economic power. Without laws that take that reality into consideration, there can be no equal justice under law. How can you have equal justice under law when one side has every trick in the book, yes. everything on their side, and, and your side has burdens that can never be met? So this lets whistleblowers have a not more than a fighting chance. They have the ability to win these cases. And I certainly hope that lawyers understand this. And the National yeah. Whistleblower Center, in response, has, re has revised its attorney referral program, trying to get more lawyers yes. to agree to take on these cases nationwide. I can understand the hesitancy to represent whistleblowers under yeah. the old precedent. They were hard cases to win. But now whistleblowers and their advocates have to capitalize on this Murray case yes. and use it to get better settlements and to push it back. Additionally, I would hope that those in the C-suite, those running corporate compliance programs and human resources programs, finally wake up. But they haven't woken up to whistleblowing for 50, 60, 70 years. Their no. hostility remains. The only thing that will make them change is fear of losing in court, period. Yes. And this case will generate that fear and maybe a shift in corporate culture. Well stated, Stephen, well stated. And I know in your uh, new book, Rules for Whistleblowers, that you uh, kind of outline everything a whistleblower might need. One of the things I've discovered that is critically important, and as I talk to whistleblowers like uh, the FinCEN whistleblower, the Russian uh, meddling whistleblower. I don't think we even need to mention names here because these are so well-known cases. What they have stated to me is they wish they'd have had an attorney. And so they started the journey on their own and they got crucified, crucified. They were like a lamb being led to slaughter. How important is it to have an attorney? Well, to put it mildly, the concept of David versus Goliath, I ask you this, how old is the Bible and how many stories of David are in it? One. Yes. In how many thousand years? So if you're taking on a David versus Goliath struggle, the bad news is Goliath usually wins. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, it yes. might be romantic. You're standing up there with your slingshot. Oh, Feels yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> Righteous. In most cases, Righteous. Yes. <laughs> most cases. So it's not a, okay. It's not a laughing matter. No. So what do the corporations have on their side? First off, law is always complex with, with deadlines, oh. filing requirements, standards, so many things. And this is not like prejudicial to a whistleblower. Whistleblower cases are known as what's known as complex civil litigation, yes. meaning there's a, it's not like, like, did you cover your whole? We're like a worker's compensation case, which is what's known as strict liability. You get hurt at work, they pay. It doesn't matter who's at fault. You didn't cover the hole in your business and someone falls through, you pay. It doesn't matter whether whether you in, pushed the person in it or they just accidentally fell. You're going to be liable. But a whistleblower case is more like a fraud case. You have to show intent, which they made much easier now. You have to get into people's minds, but you're fighting an opponent that has all these advantages up front. Yes. The first advantage is a lawyer or a law firm that's experienced in these type of cases and is willing to fight till the end. 
that's enough to intimidate most whistleblowers never to file, to settle for a nickel, or many to lose their cases. Yes. So the first issue is how do you get lawyers to represent whistleblowers? Yes. So we can actually figure it out in time. The first law, which was passed in 1976, Civil Rights Attorneys Fee Act, said that if a certain classes of victims, which include whistleblowers, but also victims of civil rights, if they win their case, the company has to pay the fees at market rates. So in other words, if the big firm is charging $500 an hour, your whistleblower lawyer can get $500 an hour, even if they were charging you $50 an hour. They look at the market. So they were hoping that enabling a whistleblower or civil rights lawyer to get a large fee if they win the case would stimulate a private bar. It did somewhat. But the problem was, what if you don't win? Oh, oh. <laughs> so you get nothing. So that, that's where the Murray case comes in oh. because it makes it a, a reasonable lawyer looking at this can see a pathway forward, can see how their client. And this is, again, why, why the rules book, without touting my own horn, is so important because it gets into the type of evidence you will need to show the contributing factor. So a lawyer looking at the evidence can say, yeah, my client can do that. Or the whistleblower, before they blow the whistle or before they get themselves fired, can say, hey, do I have the evidence if I do get fired to win? It's all laid out. Then the second thing is that the whistleblower lawyer has to do is, can we meet our burden? And again, in the Trevor's case, that burden has now shifted to the company. The company has to prove by clear and convincing evidence they would have fired the whistleblower. So again, a lawyer reasonably looking now at the facts can make a, a judgment that, yeah, I have a strong case. I can win. So even if it takes me nine years, I'll get a fee of a couple million dollars. And the company sees the same thing. So you need the ability to prevail, which Murray's case has done. Third, and this is what Congress did with Dodd-Frank and the False Claims Act, the whistleblower reward cases made it financially feasible to get a lawyer. Because these cases usually come in above a million dollars where the whistleblower gets an award, one million, two million, maybe on the average of about five million. So it's like a tort. It's like doing a personal injury case or a medical malpractice case. Because if the whistleblower proves the fraud, they get a percentage of the sanction. So again, it shifted how a whistleblower gets paid from winning an often extremely difficult mm -hmm. employment case to proving that your allegations were right. And that proof is to the prosecutors, to the SEC, to the Department of Justice, entities that institutionally should be receptive to strong evidence of misconduct. So this is now, sh it's, it's a shift. Today, whistleblowers can get lawyers if they have a strong reward case, and hopefully the Murray case will break this dam for retaliation. Yes, and, and you know, the, I will toot the horn on your book because it is just incredibly detailed in how to proceed in this. Will the Murray case help the length of time these cases take, which often is 10, 15 years. I mean, I think they hope people will die. Will, will it help the length of time, Stephen? Yeah, yes, absolutely, for a couple reasons. First, it will increase settlement. Logical employers will now realize that there is a cost to them in terms of not just money, but public relations, 
and culture and many issues if they fight a just whistleblower. So there will be better settlements and faster. But more important, now that the standards of proof have changed, a lot of what slows down these cases is something known as a motion to dismiss, where the company comes in and says, hey, you don't have enough evidence to go forward. If a lower court dismisses that, it goes up on appeal, it can go on for years. This will make it much harder for companies to have cases dismissed at the initial phase. Then the company gets a second bite at the apple to get a case thrown out, which is called summary judgment. After discovery, the company goes to the judge and says, hey, if you believe what the whistleblower is saying, we still win. And under the old burden of proof, I would say the majority of whistleblower cases went down on summary judgment mm. because the courts would say, oh, yeah, you have some evidence, but not enough to meet your burden. Or you don't have the proof of pretext. Now the company has to prove they didn't have pretext. So oh. by shifting these burdens, it makes it much harder for companies to prevail in these major pre-trial motions in which most whistleblowers have lost. And even if they didn't lose, appealed, they were forced to appeal, get a higher court to reverse it, and the delays and the costs go on forever. So both from a right. tactical perspective and I think in a corporate self-interest perspective, settlements should be far easier and more uh -huh. just. And the litigation process should be much faster. That's just excellent news, Stephen. Excellent news. You know, and, and I'll I never... just want to say this. Sure, sure. The history of whistleblowing has been people like Trevor Murray, yes. Sharon Watkins, Ernie Fitzgerald, Fred Whitehurst, yes. Bradley Birkenfeld, and yes, Jane Turner, to, to trailblaze. Yeah. to spend the nine years and to mm. change the way things are. We got to just keep moving. And I just yes. to your listeners right now, I have to say this. If you think corporate America is sitting back on this, if you think they're open arms with these types of burdens, if you think they're smiling when a whistleblower gets a $5 million reward check, you are living in a dreamland. They are out to destroy these laws. They used to have a lot more success in court. So they've been losing in court. So they're going to shift to Congress. They're mm. going to try to gut these laws. We see it every day. Mm. We need public support at the National Whistleblower Center, whistleblowers.org. We have to maintain these hard-fought victories. We have to go forward. They are unrelenting. Whistleblowers.org. Check it out. And you're absolutely, absolutely right on point. Now, before we wrap up, and I know your time is valuable, Stephen, thank you for sharing it with us. I know I'll never forget sitting in trial and on one side there was a whole table full of lawyers and on the other side there was just you and me and talk about david and goliath you won against the fbi against the government just phenomenal but now now let's bring it to today not only are you writing books this latest one is a truly a, a treasure rules for whistleblowers but you are on a worldwide tour of educating people in whistleblowing law. I know you were over in England hooking up with Whistleblowers UK. I know you've got your fellow people uh, over in all different points of the world educating people on whistleblowing, explaining the American system which to some is they don't, it's very confusing and, you know, it's all about money, but you're educating. So what is, what is your future? I know you're a grandfather and at the same time, you're got all these things going around the world. It's very exciting. 
for whistleblowers. Tell us what your plans are. Well, the United States has gone forward with whistleblowing. The Dodd-Frank Act, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, money laundering. We've really moved it forward. And whistleblowers yes. are turning in some of the largest cases, multi-billion dollar sanctions. Whistleblowers are winning for like the first time ever. They are winning. And we know that our enemies are going crazy. So we're going worldwide for two reasons. One is fraud and corruption is worldwide. If we can get other countries to either use our laws or to duplicate them to fight corruption across the board, this is, you know, would just be unbelievable. But it's also some self-interest there because as more countries adopt our laws, it will make it harder for the Chamber of Commerce to repeal them or weaken them. Right now, the United States stands alone. Uh, you know, it, it's very scary. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act has not been followed by any country in the world, despite its remarkable record of success. And our newly enacted money laundering law, which has worldwide application, yes. has already been bringing down giants. But no other country has risen and enacted these type of laws. We are vulnerable. We're just one nation standing up and with just a handful of laws, underfinanced, and they can knock them down. We need countries like Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, India, Mexico to start joining in realistically. And we'll see what happens. But as I said earlier, this is a fight. We see it in the halls of Congress. We see it when we're trying to pass simple legislation that on its face has total bipartisan support, but in the background is getting stabbed and sabotaged. Yes. We see it. And we understand that without strong public support. So that's the National Whistleblower Center game plan. Public support in the United States that we can generate and let's get other nations and NGOs and human rights defenders to start joining in and backing us up. We can't do it alone. That is Stephen Cohn, a legend and an icon in the whistleblower world. Thank you, Stephen. You are so inspiring. And thank you for explaining the Trevor Murray case to us. Do you have any last words? Yeah, I just want to take my hat off. I've never met Trevor, but I want to thank him. I want to thank his lawyer for the fight they put up and the change they made, literally, that will impact thousands and thousands of people. Thank you. And Jane, I want to thank you for Whistleblower of the Week for bringing these stories and these issues to the public's attention day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And we will be having Trevor Murray on Whistleblower of the Week. You have a good day, my friend. Thank you for listening. And please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to read more whistleblower stories, go to www.whistleblowersblog.org. Music by Rachel Kilgore. Editing and booking by Anissa Shake and Victoria Thompson. And a special thanks to our sponsors, Whistleblower Network News. The truth is hard.